So, today uh, we're going to speak to Dr. Stephen Krashen, who needs no introduction, I'm sure. Um, we're here at the, the Extensive Reading Seminar at Tsukiyama Women's University in Nagoya, Japan, and we'll talk about extensive reading, of course, uh, very soon. But if I could ask you a few questions about your very productive career to date. Um, I read that you started out you started out in Ethiopia with the Peace Corps. Was that your first teaching position? I started out in Chicago in 1941 in Loretta Hospital. Okay. But my first, in Chicago on the north side, but my first teaching position, uh, gee, guess, I guess so, I guess that was my first full-time job. That was Ethiopia 1964 to 1966. Hmm. Uh, I was, uh, I met my now wife there, hmm. been married 45 years. Wow which makes us the third longest married couple in California, I think. <laughs> My sister is second, okay. Uh, she joined because she was full of um, the, ability, the desire to serve and help. She still is. I was trying to avoid the draft, mm -hmm. which at the time the Vietnam War was very hot. Mm -hmm. And I got a deferment going into the Peace Corps and didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and wound up teaching English, of course, mm -hmm. the old-fashioned, terrible way, because I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. I worked very hard on trying to acquire the language of the country, of the area, mm -hmm. which was very tough, because everybody wanted to speak English. Mm -hmm. I was in the, in the capital, but I had, had some progress. And that was uh, my early 20s, where three years out of four I spent abroad, mm -hmm. the other uh, year in Europe, mm -hmm. doing music. And so that stimulated my interest in languages, that's for sure. And then that's what led you to come back and study languages further in... Right. I went back, we uh, married, and I decided I wanted to travel, see the world, and become an ESL teacher. Hmm. Which might have been a good option for hmm. me, looking back. Uh, so I enrolled in an ESL program mm -hmm. at UCLA, and I really liked it, but I was seduced by the dark side of the force, hmm. by linguistics. Hmm. Uh, I was seduced by Chomsky and grammar, mm. which I still think is absolutely wonderful. And it took me years to get over this and see that my true destiny was in language acquisition. Okay. So I don't regret those years. I learned a lot, mm -hmm. but it was a roundabout path. Well, when you when you started out, um, when you were first doing your PhD, I guess you could say that applied linguistics or, or maybe second language acquisition was a fairly new field. There was room. There was a lot of room. To, to move around, a lot of things to, to learn. Yes, those are interesting terms. Yes. Applied linguistics as a term I don't think exists anymore. Mm -hmm. I think we pretty well destroyed it. Mm -hmm. Not trying to be nasty, but it turned out that way. Because mm -hmm. in those days, when you were a student in an ESL program or were doing some graduate work in it, what you did is you worked on grammar. You mm -hmm. looked at grammatical structures. You would do your dissertation on, you know, the passive voice or something. Mm -hmm how it's done in various languages, then you translate this into pedagogical materials, and it was assumed that the better description you had, the better you could teach. So it's clear to me that you know all the ESL teachers should study Chomsky and grammar because that was the best description. It turns out that's not how language is acquired. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm looking directly in the camera, we are making the same mistake in the field of English for academic purposes. Mm -hmm. And that we're doing very good academic work in the, in the uh, construction of academic texts, how they're put together, genre analysis, all these things. Uh, more and more sophisticated, more and more subtle. Mm -hmm. But they're not, that's not how we learn it. That's, they're not teaching materials. It's mm -hmm. pure linguistics as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And it all comes through comprehensible input, through reading. But I'm jumping ahead. Well, no, that, I'm glad you mentioned it. Because when you came out with the, the five, five hypotheses in the, in the 70s, and when you first presented them, the acquisition and learning and natural order and, and uh, monitor and so on, um, did you realize or did you think what you were doing um, would have such an impact? Yes. You did? The moment it hit. Mm. The moment I realized that there were two systems going on, mm. that there was a learned and an acquired system, and the learned system was very constrained, mm. and that most of our competence came from acquisition, and it was done through comprehensible input, mm -hmm. and that affective factors outside, acted outside language acquisition device. Mm -hmm. They kept the input out. The moment that hit, there was a felt sense that I knew it was right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very hard to shake me from that because it felt so good. Mm. Uh, and I remember talking to my best friend at the time, still my buddy Larry Hyman, who was chair of the linguistics department. We've been at USC, we've been grad students together. And I said, Larry, I 
think I found the answer. Mm -hmm. This is it. Mm -hmm. This is like finding the structure of DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, I was going to say what, what Rosetta Stone, but that has two meanings now. Uh, this is the answer. We've made the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I thought it was right, right on. But actually, I, I mean, I've been looking back through some of your work this week, obviously, before we met. Um, and I was looking at the, the Natural Approach, one of your books, mm -hmm. and uh, you were quite clear that that these were hypotheses. They still are. That they still are. But by the also... way, the good chapters in those books were written by Tracy Terrell, okay. who should have been the first author. We decided to go alphabetic. I love his stuff in that book, and I keep getting credit for it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make that clear yeah, yeah. when I post this one up. But well, then between the two of you, it yes. was very clear that although they were hypotheses, you did say that. Um, However, we don't have any counterexamples to prove them otherwise. Still don't. And that's my kind of the question. Opinion, still don't. So they absolutely stand up to, yes. to any scrutiny? And the way that science works, there's two things going on here. The way science works according to the traditional way, Karl Popper, you have a hypothesis. Mm. Let's say I have a hypothesis, all languages in the world have pronouns. Mm. And you look at 5,000 languages, they all have pronouns. Mm. Can you say, I've proved it? Mm. No, you can't because someone might find another one that doesn't. Your whole, and then what happens, your hypothesis is gone, it's destroyed. Mm -hmm. Of course, then you start looking for a deeper hypothesis, a better one that takes things into account. So you can never prove anything, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you can only disprove. And sometimes, even when you have tons of supporting evidence, it's not enough. Because mm -hmm. some people have a strong felt sense the other way. Mm -hmm. There's a, a famous uh, quote from Mary Schweitzer, a paleontologist, mm -hmm. who discovered that Tyrannosaurus bones that she looked at had some organic matter in it, mm -hmm. which is quite amazing, because they're supposed to be a lot older. Mm -hmm. And the reigning paleontologist thought it was horrible, couldn't be true, articles rejected, she was talking to one big shot who rejected all her papers, and she said, look, I've got evidence. He says, I don't care. Well, what kind of evidence would convince you? And he said, none. <laughs> so I think what I've come across are a lot of people who no matter what evidence you have, they say, well, it's just not right. Mm -hmm. I have the other felt sense that it is right, but I hope I'm open to counter evidence. Mm -hmm. If there is true counter evidence, I will look for a deeper hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And it's to my benefit to be the first person to notice that it's wrong, to mm -hmm. point out that it's wrong. But so far, so good. So this is one way of doing science. You look for mm -hmm. There's another way, which I learned from Chomsky. In his book, Syntactic Structures, 1957, mm -hmm. he is a beautiful analysis of how the negative works in English and how the auxiliary has to be set up. And then he says, let's look at our interrogatives. Mm -hmm. Notice that the same mechanism we set up for negatives will also handle interrogatives. That isn't proof that we've got a good description, but that should mean something. Mm -hmm. So uh, my point is we started this off with adult second language. Mm -hmm. It fit for some very limited experimental conditions. Then it fit for more conditions. Then it explained affect. Then it explained why some methods work. Then I noticed it works for child language acquisition. In fact, it looks for, works for acquisition in general. It works very nicely. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in the 1980s, I discovered the work of Frank Smith, which just completely turned me around. It's wonderful. I feel like I saved five years just by reading his stuff. And I said, there's the same hypothesis that we learn to read by reading. Ken Goodman said the same thing. We learn to read by understanding what's on the page. Mm -hmm. And their research came from completely different angles mm -hmm. than mine, different data. And if you read Smith's work, you see he explains it much more clearly than I ever could. It's beautiful. So that felt good. Mm -hmm. Then I started looking at extensive reading research in first language, mm -hmm. uh, sustained silent reading stuff, the early stuff. And by gosh, that works too. Mm -hmm. Then I got embroiled in bilingual education controversies mm -hmm. in the United States in the 90s. And the best way of explaining why bilingual ed works when it does is comprehensible input, when it gives you background knowledge to make input more comprehensible. Mm -hmm. In the last few years, I'm continuing to look at all these areas at once. It's all one field. But I've been looking lately at animal studies. Mm -hmm. Is the comprehension hypothesis a contender? Mm -hmm for how chimpanzees acquire sign. Mm -hmm. I'm going to present uh, this afternoon the case of a parrot, a Cosmo. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lady in Athens, Georgia, a retired professor of, of uh, retired of comparative literature has been talking to a parrot for 10 years. <laughs> and oh gosh, it's very good. How animals develop their own communication systems, how vervet monkeys mm -hmm. uh, acquire their distress calls, mm -hmm. which are, you know, coded for different kinds of attacks. 
And you know, comprehensible input, it's not an airtight case, but it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. There are some cases where it looks like they're getting correction and all that, and that means we gotta look a little deeper. Mm -hmm. So the case isn't, you know, as so solid as we have for human language, but it's helping me understand the research, mm -hmm. no question. That's just because some, it means something. Yeah, this is the idea. Mm -hmm. It should count for something. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next area of research, I hope, will happen within the next hundred years, and that's when the aliens finally land, and we'll figure out how to talk to them. Mm. Although so far it looks like it's all telepathy, if you Maybe. believe the abduction case. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, so it's pretty conclusive. You, you, as far as you know, up to date, nothing is disproved. No, and yes. I have looked at every single counterexample I could. The uh, current uh, contenders, Opponents are comprehensible output, or mm -hmm. Swain's idea, mm -hmm. and I've argued there just isn't enough of it to mm -hmm. do any good. Uh, also, correction and grammar is still up there, mm -hmm. and people are, it's, you know, desperately seeking a role for grammar. It's there, but it's just not very strong, it's very limited. And all the studies, they, they seem to write their conclusions before they analyze the data. Mm -hmm. They see this proves grammar works, and they'll find one out of five effects works borderline, therefore grammar. Mm -hmm. And I think the data all shows when it does work, it's under very constrained conditions when the conditions for the conscious monitor are met. Mm -hmm. uh, John Truscott has found the same thing, same thing with correction. So this, this is really supporting data. So the good thing is all these hypotheses have made, helped me make sense out of all this research. And yet, and yet probably grammar translation is probably still the prevalent methodology oh, yeah. worldwide. Yes, yep, because we have failed to do good PR. You must be very happy about that. <laughs> Still working on it. Mm, I see. So actually, well, that, I guess that takes you back to, I've, I'll mention this book again, The Natural Approach. Um, I don't know if it's fair to say this is a methodology. I mean, yeah. approach is in the title. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess this came around the same time that things like task-based learning and communicative language learning were becoming yes. um, popular. Um, but it's been said that now we're in a post-methods era. Yeah. But we're not, okay. Oh, no. So what do you no, think no, about no. that? No, I think method is perfectly fine. It's just a, a way of teaching that's consistent with the theoretical approach. So there's, um, I mean, but there are more than one, there is more than one method that you could use. Absolutely. That, that there are fit. several methods, in my biased opinion, mm. that are all consistent with comprehensible input. Mm. Uh, natural approach is one. TPR was unbelievably interesting. Mm. And Asher came out with it, great. And it's certainly consistent. Mm. I think Asher was years ahead. Mm. Uh, since then, TPRS homework assignment for anyone watching this video mm. is to go to Google and look at TPRS. Just mm. Google it. High school foreign language teachers in the United States, a true grassroots movement, very interesting, where they find this stuff works, originated by a Spanish teacher, mm. then in California, Blaine Ray. Very interesting. It's all based on storytelling and developing stories with your kids. Very consistent with the work. He developed it and we, you know, mm -hmm. discovered each other later. Same with Tracy mm -hmm. and me. Uh, Tracy had the idea before he heard of me. What does the what does the acronym stand for? Total It used to be T P R plus storytelling. Okay. Total physical response. Now it's teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling. Okay. And small groups of teachers mm have organized themselves into like companies, mm. small-time entrepreneurs. Mm. And they put, the, put together conferences, develop materials. It's a great example of ethical capitalism, mm. where people are charging a reasonable amount, mm. uh, inexpensive materials, sharing it. They work in different areas of the country, so there's no competition. They all get along. And you go to these seminars, and it's teachers. Mm. There's no publishers. Mm. They have their own stuff. Uh, there's no university professors, mm -hmm. except me usually, okay? And you can take short courses. Mm -hmm. You can take, I took an intensive Mandarin twice, nine hour course. Mm -hmm. Whenever I go to these things, I take intermediate Spanish, because mm -hmm. I have my teachers there, and they're just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So you have a great time. And those are, well, those are all methods. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have sheltered subject matter teaching, which is a method, content-based actually, mm -hmm. for intermediates. We have extensive reading, which is a method, or you could call it a technique. Mm. Uh, you can combine it with shelter, do popular literature. Mm. Uh, all these things are methods, but they're simply different manifestations of comprehensible input, I mm. think, with proper use of grammar. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you did mention reading as a, as a potentially a very good source of comprehensible input very early on in your career, but it seems to become more and more important, and I think 
is it fair to say that you've become uh, more convinced that extensive reading is probably one of the best ways or the it's, best way? It's wonderful. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, and uh, you have to be doing it yourself all the time. And then you see it happen. You have to be reading in other languages and you can just feel yourself growing. I, so I read that uh, I read in one of your articles that you've been reading Star Trek novels in French. At any moment and, with me, mm. I have a novel in my pocket mm. in French or German mm. that I read while waiting for the elevator. Mm. I have one in my pocket right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will show the camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a collection of short stories. There, there you, you go. go. Trying to find new authors in mm -hmm. science fiction in French. Um, and I'm running out. It's getting hard. Mm. And I'll put in a plug for Book Mooch. Mooch.com. Ah. Way cool. That's where I've been getting a lot of my stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a book swap thing yes, where yes. you can clean out your office and your home and put stuff up and someone orders it from you, you send it, you mm -hmm. pay the most and you get points, you can get other stuff. So I've been using that for French, German, and Spanish novels. Perfect thing. That's nice. Yeah, okay. And cleaning up the office. Um, well, one thing about extensive reading is I sometimes feel that um, people say they're doing it, but they're not. Or they, they misunderstand what it actually is. Um, so what, what do you think we need to know about extensive reading? What exactly is it? <laughs> it's a big question. Books, first of all, that are interesting and comprehensible. Mm -hmm. More than interesting. Mm -hmm. Compelling. Mm -hmm. The goal is to find things to read that are so interesting you forget that it's in another language. Mm -hmm. Where you, you don't even notice the words that you don't quite understand. Because mm -hmm. the story is so interesting you can't wait to get to the next page. Mm -hmm. You have to look things up, the book's too hard. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, very little, perhaps zero accountability is the ideal. Mm -hmm. um, books are available in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, the person doesn't have to finish every book they start. Mm -hmm. You can read comic books, you can read manga, you can read magazines, you can read whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, if po possible, not even a log, just really good books. Some time set aside to do it, nothing else. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, I, I hear about some teachers perhaps who set comprehension tests at the end of readers or they no, give out class no, sets no, of graded no, readers no. where everyone reads the same no, book. No. Now, that's you know, everybody why reading the same book. Reading. Everybody reading the same book is okay if you're doing literature. Okay, as long as it's and a that's good book. Difference. Yeah, we're, we're, the core of language arts, and I think a lot of ESL, EFL, with good reason, is literature. I'm all for it. You know, and this is philosophy, ethics, and metaphysics embedded in fiction, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful way to do it. I'm a big fan of this. This is one of the reasons we go to school mm -hmm. and get introduced to great literature. Um, free reading is summer. Mm -hmm. So what, you, what people can do is have a literature class where they're all looking at one book, like, mm -hmm. we're all going to read <coughs> Hunger Games, mm -hmm. and, which I think is an excellent book, mm -hmm. and talk about its implications for society. Mm -hmm. Okay, what does it mean and all that. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, but also 10, 15 minutes is set aside to read what you want to read. Mm -hmm. Some brilliant people have combined these two. Mm -hmm. And I recommend two books, uh, Don Allen Miller, mm -hmm. called The Book Whisperer, which mm -hmm. is written for native speaker middle school kids. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Nancy Atwell, mm -hmm. The Reading Zone, mm -hmm. again for middle school native speakers, where the kids are doing a lot of self-selected reading, but they're sharing their literature circles, they talk about their books, they wind up reading an enormous amount and discussing its literary merits, and it's all relevant. Mm. Our goal, someday, is to get everyone reading the classics. Mm. The way to get it is first massive amounts of interesting contemporary stuff. I suppose some teachers might be worried that where's their role in this? Because if, if they really can, if, if students really can learn uh, English through reading alone and reading the right things and reading interesting things a lot. Why do we need a teacher? I think the teacher's role now is a lot easier, more interesting, pleasant, and probably more important than it ever was. Mm -hmm. The goal of the teacher is to do two things. Bring you up to the intermediate level mm -hmm. so you can talk outside of class, mm -hmm. so you can, get, you can understand what people tell you and do some reading outside of class and improve on your own. And, and th to do that, you have to organize things. They have to make the books available. They have to do the literature part, mm -hmm. uh, discuss people, help them have to discuss with students, help them find better reading. This is why we conference, mm -hmm. uh, to help you become a reader. And also to tell you how language is acquired. Mm -hmm. I hope that the comprehension hypothesis mm -hmm. will be considered 
a legal way of acquiring language mm -hmm. rather than an outlaw. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that we should make it required that all students believe in the comprehension hypothesis, but I think they should know about it. Mm -hmm. I think they should have the option. They should know when they finish that some people think, and there's research, that if you want to increase your vocabulary, don't do vocabulary prep. Mm -hmm. Read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. If you want to get better on TOEFL and TOEIC, uh, take it easy with the TOEFL prep and the TOEIC prep, but read a lot of books. Uh, you want to get your grammar better? Yeah, a little grammar here and there might help when you have a chance to monitor, but most of it comes through reading. Mm -hmm. uh, not to worry about error correction. Mm -hmm. I think to be autonomous, they have to know how to get better, how to improve. Mm -hmm. So two things, help kids get to the intermediate level, giving them comprehensible input in class, mm -hmm. and tell them how to get better. That's at the beginning level, you've got to have classes. Mm -hmm. You've got to have teachers. Because the adult will not get comprehensible input from the outside world, because mm -hmm. it's too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're doing ES, let's say you're doing EFL in Japan, mm -hmm. there aren't English speakers for you to talk to. And when you do find a few, you can't understand what they say. Mm -hmm. And if I come here to Japan and I want to pick up Japanese, I can spend 20 years here and never get comprehensible mm -hmm. input. Okay? But if you go to a language class, the first 10 minutes, you can get comprehensible input. Let me give you my experience because it's identical mm. to everybody's experience who's watching this table, not because it's different. I probably spent three months of my life in Taiwan mm. since 2000. Mm. I was going there every year for a while, various conferences, getting invited here, invited there. I have lots of friends, I have a good time, Mandarin all around me. Mm. After three months of hearing Mandarin, the only thing I could say or understand in Mandarin was wishy one ming shi ling, I like ice cream, which is about it. Mm -hmm. I then took TPRS Mandarin, a nine hour class with my wonderful teacher, Linda Lee, she's mm -hmm. so good. The first five minutes, the first three minutes, mm -hmm. I got more comprehensible input in that class mm -hmm. than I did all that time in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. That's the value of classes. Mm -hmm. Beginners belong in language classes. Mm -hmm. Because the language classes will give you the comprehensible input that the outside world will not. Mm -hmm. The intermediate is to get you involved in reading, literature, etc. Mm -hmm. To reach the point where you can do it on your own. So those classes should be all in L2, you no. take it? No? No. no. Uh, L1 is fine mm -hmm. to give background knowledge. Mm -hmm. When you know something tough is coming up, a little explanation mm -hmm. here and there. Blaine Ray has this great technique called pop-up grammar. Mm -hmm. Now this is where you have a common language with the students. Mm -hmm. uh, where he'll interrupt the class for maybe five seconds mm -hmm. to explain something in English about mm -hmm. the grammar. For example, two, two examples. In my Mandarin class, my Mandarin teacher interrupted the class and said in English, by the way, Mandarin doesn't have an infinitive, we just string the verbs together. <laughs> they can take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are junior linguists and you know, amateur linguists thought, oh, this is the most interesting thing in the world. People with a more reasonable view of life, you know, uh, just kept going and ignored it. Yeah. So this is a little linguistics. Mm -hmm. In the Spanish class, uh, Jason Fritz, my wonderful Spanish teacher, mm -hmm. interrupted and said, oh, by the way, this little O at the end of the verb, that means past tense. Mm -hmm. Now, people, some people want to use that, some people want to monitor it, other people used it to understand what was going on, most people ignored it. Mm -hmm. So an occasional thing like that, fine. Where the kids have no idea, you say, oh, this word means blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Or some background reading in the first language. Mm -hmm. So when we use the first language to input, make input more comprehensible, it's okay. Mm -hmm. When we use it instead, like for translation, then it's not okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Good, good. Thank you. Now, um, I've got a five-year-old son. I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old son. And my five-year-old's uh, very interested in books, loves books, can't read himself yet. Um, what should I be doing to teach him to read? Not phonics, I take it. Read aloud. Read aloud. Read aloud, read aloud, read aloud. And follow with my finger? No. I'm now, I just completed a draft of a paper mm. called Interrupting. Should we interrupt read alouds? Mm. There's now a trend in the United States which the newspapers are jumping on. Mm. These researchers, these people, they just can't help it, I guess. It's just form, form, form. They're having people read aloud to kids, and every so often, an experimental group, the reader will stop and point out aspects of the print. Mm -hmm. Like, this word means danger. Mm -hmm. Or, do you know how this is pronounced? Mm -hmm. Here's a, the line in the bubble is B, it's a bug. Can you say bug? You know, stuff like that. And they looked at whether this helped the kids have more print awareness, phonemic awareness, all this. And there was a little bit of an effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So they said, we should be doing this. Mm. And I think there's a danger of disrupting the story, first of all. Mm. And they admit that's possible. And then I looked at the comparison groups, which they didn't do. They just looked at the experiment groups. Mm. The comparison groups got better, too. Mm. Uh, nearly as much, about half as much as the other. So just reading stories is going to give you that. <clears throat> so if you want your child to get better, mm. I wouldn't follow along with the finger unless he asks you to. Okay. I wouldn't point out the print unless he asks you to. Mm. Enjoy the story. Living in your house, mm. your kids have no choice but to become highly literate. It's only a question of when. Mm. The schools get very excited on speed, mm. and people vary in rates of acquisition. So I wouldn't worry about it. Lots of good stories. Mm. So at what point will I be able to put the book in front of him and he'll be able to start reading it? Could happen anywhere between now and age seven. Okay. And it's inevitable. He'll, kids get excited about writing, about learning the alphabet anyway. You can't stop it. There's something innate about it. And, you know, they, they did a study a few years ago, and they found that every kid they looked at when they saw the golden arches could thought it meant McDonald's. Mm. You know, and they had, you know, they're starting to get the M sound mm -hmm. and all that. It's pretty much inevitable. Mm. And the amount of phonics that you need to become a reader, actually, you probably don't need any. But a little bit is a little helpful. We call it alphabetics, basic phonics. It's mm. basically initial consonants mm. and a few of the vowel sounds. And when you teach the alphabet, you get that. Mm -hmm. I would never deny this stuff to kids when they ask. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. And I certainly would teach the alphabet. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. The studies they say now that are phonics, that so phonics works, here's what they found. They have intensive phonics where the kids do. They learn every phonics rule known to civilization and they teach it to all kids in a strict order. And the feds, the government of the United States have said that the kids read better and the UK has said the same thing, big pronouncements about phonics programs and big study in Scotland. And when you look at the data, the kids who have intensive phonics do better on tests where you read lists of words in isolation and you pronounce them aloud. They do not do better in reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. And that's what counts. And kids who learn to read by reading, by hearing stories, get all that stuff eventually anyway. Mm -hmm. Most of our knowledge of phonics is the result of reading, not the cause. Mm -hmm. Big confusion of cause and effect. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll bear that in mind. Yeah, yeah, you'll be <laughs> fine. Just make sure he doesn't go to law school. <laughs> well, I think that's a nice positive final message. Mm -hmm. so, don't go to law school. <laughs> Okay. Well, if he wants to go, he has to pay for it himself. How's that? Well, I think that may be inevitable with yes. the current state of education. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do all this therapy. <laughs>